We Hello. are live. We're live. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello again. It's Charlotte and Jessica. That's right. We're here at Aragon Wine Market in Pensacola, Florida for mm -hmm. our weekly virtual wine tasting. That's we right. used to have our wine tastings here in the store every Thursday um, from 5 to 7. And we haven't been able to do that, um, but we've really been enjoying the virtual tastings and um, it seems like the customers are as well. So we appreciate that. We appreciate everybody that tunes in. Um, I think that's definitely a good note before we like move on into our intro. People who come in all the time that are newer customers to us, especially in the last few months that say, you know, oh, do you guys do anything like a wine tasting? And we're like, gosh, we wish we could. Um, you know, and so we obviously share the information about the virtual wine tasting, but in in months to come, hopefully, you know, less than six months, who knows what it's going to be, but hopefully in the coming months, we'll get back to, um, you know, business as usual to some degree with some revisions and be able to see your pretty faces again in yeah. the shop. Yeah, yeah, and I so, think so. Yeah, normally it would be on Thursdays um, from five to seven, uh, you know, beautiful opportunity to come in and try. It's a complimentary wine tasting, which mm -hmm. I always thought was the coolest thing. Yeah, a lot, uh, of, a lot of places and a lot of um, people have said, oh, you should charge for it. Um, a lot of times people will uh, charge five, ten dollars and then, you get a credit when you come back, but we've never done that. And I just personally just, you know, this is the way we do it. We want everybody to feel like they can come. And if you want to buy something, you do. And if you don't, um, you're still getting the education and getting to try some things that you haven't normally tried. So Absolutely. And that's the best part when, when we do have those live tastings is trying you know, having multiple wines in front of you, yeah. some, one you may have had before or something similar. And I kind of have a pet peeve about that because no. people will be like, oh, I don't want to try the Chardonnay. I don't like Chardonnay. I'm like, well, you know, that's why you're here at the tasting. It's free. <laughs> just yep. just try, yep. just try the Chardonnay or the cap or whatever it is that you think you don't like and confirm or maybe open your minds up to a different one that uh, you might, might not have tried before and you think, hey, this is pretty pretty cool absolutely so um, I can definitely say that that was my experience with the uh, the Yolumba the Y series Chardonnay because it's not it's unwooded um, and the first time I had that I was very much for that person and I don't really care for Chardonnays often because I don't I'm not an oaky buttery yeah heavy person often um, and then I tried that one and it really opened my mind to I, and the I use doors. Chardonnay as an example because yeah, I think that is one. the most common one that people um, Either that or rosé, because a lot mm -hmm. of people think that rosé is going to be a sweet, um, sweet white zen right. type. And or anything compared to Boone's Farm. Yeah. Boone's Farm, which it's the furthest from. Um, and yeah, and so, I mean, and I, I think people are getting on board with both yeah. of those now, but um, but that's what the wine tastings are great for. And what we've tried to do with these virtual wine tastings are try some different wines that we do not have. We've got a perfect example of that tonight, because we've got Definitely. a white from South Africa, and um, a red from Lebanon, which is yeah. pretty cool. Like I, this is like who's who's had Lebanese wine? So not I. Um, but so a little housekeeping. We are still doing curbside. Um, if you want to call us, um, uh, we're happy to bring out the bottles or a case or whatever you want to the curbside. We've got little um, some parking out front. Yeah. Um, there's always parking in the back as well. We've got those signs. Um, marks it's designated parking back there so you're welcome to uh, park back there we are doing a special right now and we've, we've sold uh, quite a few of the cases yeah. um so what we're doing is a promo and it's the first 12 bottles that we did um for the virtual wine tastings so it's box one we're calling it mm -hmm. um uh, we've pulled all the wines from that uh first few wine tasting mm -hmm. or virtual wine tastings and we're given a 15 percent discount on them yeah. So if you tried them and you loved them, here's a good time to get them um, at a better, better price, a good price. Absolutely. If you missed them and you uh, want to try them, then uh, it's a, a good time for that as well. So Yeah, and I, we had both customers today picking up their boxes, one of which had tried the virtual wines before, wanted to revisit them, was excited that, you know, she was going to have some, um, you know, another family member coming in town and be able to kind of explore those wines with them finally and have that kind of community and camaraderie. And then another customer had never had any of them and uh, was super excited to start exploring them and great. go back to the videos you know, you don't always right. just have to listen to us. You can kind of fast forward if you like and yeah. get to some of the information. And, um, you know, we go through the housekeeping, but certainly there's so much education and, and yeah. the wealth of knowledge you're gaining from not, you know, Michael Fix is amazing and incredibly knowledgeable, but it's been so incredible to also reach out to people like 
Lisa, like um, Julie Johnson, you know, like yeah. Lott, um, with Charlotte, um, yeah, yeah. you know, all the different people that we've gotten to talk to that we normally probably wouldn't have been able to have this interaction with. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's been great. And, um, and if you are just tuning in for the first time, because there might be some people out there that haven't watched how this, um, our, our little show, um, how this works is that I announce, um, like last week on um, last week's show, what wines we'll be doing for this week's show. Mm -hmm gives you a week to come in here or wherever you are um, to get the wines and have them ready um, re have them ready um, and maybe uh, sometimes we'll give you a little idea of a pairing of food pairing or um, uh, a dish or cheese anything that we think might go well with these get you all set up and then you tune in and um, and ask questions. Feel free to ask questions. I see Doug Dixon says he's late. That's okay. We're happy to have we you. Are. We've been stalling, actually. That's right. <laughs> no, we haven't. But we're happy to have you. You and you know, um, especially you know, other customers like Bill and Pam. That every week, you know, either they come in, and you just get the bottles that we're going to be tasting, or perhaps you're grabbing, you know, the bottles for the tasting and a couple of bottles for the weekend, and kind of just stocking yourself up yeah. to get you through. So it's your one trip. And we're really, you know, excited to have you guys week after week join us and ask those questions. Um, if you are watching it on our individual Facebook pages, um, if you would go to the Aragon Wine Market main page where we're, we're mainly streaming this broadcast from, we can't see your individual comments on our personal pages right now, but we can see them on the Aragon page through this application. Right. So if you would go back to the Aragon Wine Market page, then any comments or questions as we're rolling through this, um, there's so much wonderful information about these incredibly unique wines um, that, you know, definitely we'll want to hear your feedback and your questions. Right. And we, without further ado, we are um, featuring the Broadbent wines tonight and we have featured those before, um, some of them. The um, uh, Vino Verde, mm -hmm. if you recall, we did the Vino Verde, which was one of our most popular ones. And um, that is a Broadbent wine. So if you recall a little bit about Broadbent, um, we didn't have Lisa from Broadbent with us, um, but we have her here now and we are going to, without further ado, Hi, Lisa. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Oh, sure. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Um, we are familiar a little bit with Broadbent, but if you can give us more um, detailed information, I think everybody would like to know a little bit about um, uh, the Broadbent selections. Sure, for sure. So I'm um, actually, I'm here in Virginia, where our office is based. Um, the company started in 1996 in San Francisco, but we moved, I say we, because I've been with the company for about 10 years, so I feel like it's a bigger we, so I just speak in terms of we. Um, obviously, I did not have anything to do with starting the company. <laughs> but um, the company moved to this thing about nine years ago, and um, just to give you an idea of how close I am to the office, my address is number 15, and the office is number 17. So the wall behind me up into the kitchen, and right next door to me is our world headquarters in Richmond, Virginia. Oh, wow. So wow. you can walk to work. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I that's just, nice. I don't. I just go over the back fence. <laughs> Literally, I just climb over the back fence. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So Broadband Selections is a, a company of, um, you know, we explain our foundation as a private they're family owned wine quarter, and we only import privately family owned wineries. And that is through us, you know, true and tried and true, and that will never change. Certainly, as we grow and we talk to other wine people and we kind of um, gather wineries, you know, as we sort of evolve, but we will only the It's so important to find a the wine business is a wine of people. And if you don't enjoy the people you're doing business with, then this is not the business for you. Yeah. yeah. Right? yeah. So, so you do have um, uh, some wines that you guys make um, on your own, but you also import some from other small wineries that you guys find that you love and uh, want to share with uh, the United States. Correct. So you mentioned you know, there which is made for us by a winery who is good friends with Bartholomew Broadbent, the owner of the company. Um, and that has been made since either 2004 or 2006, I can't remember. 
but from a family <laughs> their own wine from their own vineyards as well, but do projects for us with our label on it. And the same thing for Bruno Valliner, it's made by one of the wineries we import, which is Huber in Austria, and he makes a wine and makes a label for us. And, yeah, and then we need to import from around the world. Today, obviously, we're talking about New Zealand. Oh, we're not. We're talking about South Africa. But we also import from Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, Germany, France now, Italy now. Um, yeah, so all over the world. Wow. Well, it's a, it's a cool company, and we we, de we definitely love them and carry quite a few of their um, products, so, or y'all's products. So, Absolutely. Um, I think the Vino Verde that I did mention is our top selling um, top selling white here at the store currently. Um, that perfect for our Floridian weather and the heat, definitely. and uh, it's light, um, crisp. Um, so, but we are not featuring that tonight. We featured that in the past. So, if anybody is interested in the Vino Verde. Uh, definitely go back and watch the video that we did and come in and it's a bargain at I think nine bucks. Like nine dollars a bottle. So. Jillian, hi to you. Uh, that's actually what Jillian took home today was the Vino Verde. She'd never had it and uh, really liked sweet wines and before she wasn't really ready to cross into the curator so we started her with the Vino Verde. Um, so hi to you too. But here's the curator bottle we're drinking right now. Everybody has their glasses. And so uh, what I'm excited about with both of these wines are that a lot of people probably haven't had a wine from South Africa and certainly not from Lebanon. So let's start with the South African one first. And if you can um, give us a little info on um, the curator. Sure. So South Africa is the country that we kind of specialize in at this point. So we import um, 13 different wineries from South Africa, again, all family owned. And we're in we didn't start out to import that many wineries from South Africa, but the beauty of South Africa is that it's such a community of winemakers and it's such a community of getting to know people in a network that once you start to do business with somebody, they just immediately recommend you to their friend who's been making wine as well, who might not have had any representation in the United States or may have had it one time and it didn't work out. So it's all been word of mouth the way we've, we've built our South African book, literally word of mouth, which I think is, again, such a nice testament to the wine business being about people. And this is the country that when you talk about wine farms, this is a country of wine farms. That's how they, that's what they call their vineyards. That's what they call their wineries, wine farms. So they are farmers and they're yeah. farming grapes for, you know, with their, with a lot of the countries, with their bare knuckles and getting down and dirty. And that's particularly true with this one because it's made by a winery by the name of Auden Horse Wine in the Swartland of South Africa. And I think it's particularly true for him because if you've gone to you know, Napa or in California, which a number of different wineries, and you've seen list vines that are just so nice and neat, and he doesn't have any of these vines. And so it's a lot more work in the vineyard to get to know some each individual cluster to make sure that that cluster is getting appropriate sun and appropriate duration. So you're really just kind of getting your hands in there. Um, so this is Chardonnay and Pinot is the blend, but Chenin is the main grape in, in this wine and the main grape in everything that he identifies. So Chenin Blanc is um, grown in primarily, I mean, it, well, it can be, it's probably grown in many places, but primarily uh, you hear about it in uh, France, in the Vouvray area. And then you hear about it in South Africa. Um, and is it, is it mostly Chenin Blanc? The, the, is that the most popular white grape in South Africa? Correct, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, Chenin is just a really magical grape and it's really adaptable to a number of different soils and climates. And in, you know, in particular in South Africa, they have some really new rich soils, lots of granite, um, lot, particularly in this area, in the Spartland, really granite dense soils. And Shenin just loves to like dig in there and soak all this up. So it does so well, not just in the Spartland, but obviously that's where Adi is. But yeah, it's, and it's, you know, it's a group that can take on a lot of faces and all of her faces are faces you want to see. 
which is, I think, it can be sparkling, it can be dry, it can be sweet, it can be clean, it can be blended. You're breaking up just a little bit on that. Okay. But you were saying it could be sweet. And yeah. Talking about, Shen, uh, talking about the Shannon. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Shannon is really adaptable, right? So it can be sparkling, it can be sweet, it can be dry. Um, it can be blended, as you can see with this one, which is blended with Chardonnay and Viennese. It does well in oak, it does well in stainless steel. And in the case of the curator, white, it's all concrete tanks. Yeah, it, you know, I um, we have a customer in the store, so Charlotte's stepping away. If anybody wonders why we ever disappear from camera, that's why. Um, but, you know, one of the things when I was reading about this, the, um, the you know, triple limestone soil is not really soil. I mean, it's very, very uh, much so. It's tons of just a very rocky soil. And so it's interesting to learn more about the grapes growing in an environment that is not really indicative. I mean, I think of, of growing plants, I think of dirt, and this is absolutely not grown in a soil structure or terrar, uh, excuse me, terrar that has that um, in any way. It's it's the triple limestone, maybe not triple limestone, I'm sorry, three different types of stone that really makes up all the components that this is grown in. Yeah, granite. Granite is Thank you. in Swart lands. Yeah, and I, I, there is a picture I think I sent through that is just so rocky, right? Yeah, we can. Uh, so this is obviously the, the map of South Africa and the bigger pink region. Um, you can see a blue dot in the middle of the pink region, and just below the blue dot is the city of Malmsbridge. So, yep, and then this winery is just outside that city of Malmsbridge. So it's that bigger pink region on the west. Yeah, it's out of the city of Malmsbridge, and that pink region is smart like this. That's cool. Well, and so um, for me, I, I like Chenin Blanc and, and Chardonnay, but my favorite white grape is Viognier, and I know this has some Viognier in it. Um, how about 100% Viognier? Do they, do they make one of those? It is not. Um, I have not come across, I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying that I have not come across a 100% Viognier in South Africa. However, if I may mention another winery that we represent from Virginia, Brazil, they do definitely have a 100% DNA. So what's funny is that, um, she says Lisa's real garbled. Yeah, you are a little garbled. I don't know if maybe you can move back if that would help. Um, I'm not sure, but um, sorry, sorry. I'm looking up a little. Um, but I was, what's funny is that you mentioned the um, Barberville and when I first discovered Viognier, it was Virginia Viognier and fell in love with it. And so we definitely, um, we, we, we have several Viogniers, including the Barbersville in the, in the store. Oh, good. Well, thank you. So my, my little less verbal, this is better or worse? That actually to me seems a little bit better. Yeah. Um, it, it was less garbled than, yeah. Okay. Has that storm you um you had mentioned the storm was passing overhead when we were testing things out over? Is it still rumbling pretty hard? It's it's just for her to rumbling. Nothing's happening yet, and we need it desperately. So I'm yeah. Sure. Maybe you maybe that we're getting some um, interference from the storm on your end. Um, so. so stay safe. Thank you. Uh, somebody said I bet if the volume on the store computer was off when Lisa talks, it would be clearer. Well, let's try that. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> you are a wealth of knowledge and um, we appreciate <laughs> Yeah. And so um, so you told me about the grapes in this. Um, how is this, um, does this have any oak on it? What, how, what is the treatment um, for this? No, it's all concrete tanks. No stainless steel, no oak, 100% concrete for fermentation. And then it's aged just a few months in the concrete before it's bottled. Okay, so it doesn't touch a drop of oak. Not a drop. Yeah, and it still has a very, it still has a real richness to it. Um, yeah, it's, it's delicious. We're drinking it right now. Mm -hmm. Dogs, I'm sorry. We're, we're a dog friendly store here, so we love, hey, we love the puppies. <laughs> I'm embarrassed, I'm really sorry. <laughs> No, it's funny. Have you ever been like I was on a Zoom thing um, <laughs> and it was like, oh, yeah, Shal Shalini says much better. She's gone. Uh, but she's back.
Anyway, my dog would be more important than that. Charlotte, what's the name of your dog, by the way? Well, my dog's name is Francois. And he's right. Francois <laughs> So, um, and we are, we'll, that we're, we're going to hold we're that to the that. end. We'll That's get right. that to the end. So Lisa, before we move on from this wine, I want to know about these amazing dinners in which the wines are blended and tasted and sampled. And before it comes to that final blend, I was reading the story, um, that there are, there are these magnanimous dinners and intense, you know, array of tastings in which it doesn't come to the final, like it's not just bottled and here's what it is, but you, there's so much going into, these tastings and these dinners to define that final blend. Will you kind of explain that for our customers a little bit more? Sure. I mean, blends are, you know, wine in, in itself, obviously, is to, it's not an easy thing to make. It's not an easy thing to grow. It's not an easy thing to make. And farmers, in whatever capacity they are, are generally very intelligent people, right? So it does take some studying of the varietals that you're growing to perfect a blend that is going to be obviously commercially successful. You want people to buy your wine, but you want it to taste good. You want it to feel good. You want it to live in the bottle. You want it to be alive in the bottle. You want it to be alive after a couple of days in the bottle, right? Because not everyone is, I think maybe like I am and drink a bottle a night. Sure. <laughs> I hope people do. <laughs> because that's yeah, I mean, as a judgment free zone. Yeah, of course. <laughs> a glass, a bottle, judgment free. You also want bottles that will, you know, you can open. So tonight, you know, for me, I open the Curator and uh, the Moussard Jeune Rouge, and I'll drink both of them over the next couple of days because right. they will taste just delicious over the next couple of days. So that is a component of blending as well. So it's really important to get to know your grapes, your vineyards, your, your, I was gonna say your barrels, but your fermentation vessels, right? In this case, it's concrete. To know exactly what that sort of, you know, Shannon is tasting, how that Viognier is tasting this year, and what that, you have to then be trained enough and be familiar enough with your, your farm to know what that bottle is going to be like in two or three years, right? So that's where the, the practice and the intelligence of blending comes in. Look at champagne blenders, right? The master blenders. Look at port right. blenders. I mean, just a really hard job. Absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't want to do it. And then, and, 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 and I think people think it's probably a simple process, but I mean, people go to school. I mean, it's more than just grapes. It's the, you know, this, the chemistry. I mean, there's, there's a lot that goes into um, nothing simple about, it. I mean, think about, you know, the earth. I mean, you're, you're also trying to protect biodiversity. You're also trying to be carbon neutral. You're also trying to, you know, prepare for your future generations. I mean, so in South Africa, have you been to South Africa? I have. Okay, I have not. Um, I assume it would be a great place to go. I'd love to go, um, maybe someday. But um, so um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, about the organic dynamic or a biodynamic that sort of movement in uh, South Africa. How does that uh, play out? Yeah, sure. I think, um, can I address a question from Doug I just saw in the comments? Yeah, Doug has a really great question that popped up. Absolutely. Do you want to read it or do you want oh, to? Oh, you can't see it. Hello, that might help. <laughs> um, I'm curious whether he said, Doug said, I'm curious whether the concrete adds anything to the wine taste. Is it porous or is it sealed? Which is an, uh, an awesome question. Mm -hmm. Right. And the answer to that is no to the first part of that question. It does not add anything to the taste. It's a way to have an, a micro, a tiny transfer of oxygen. So it is slightly porous um, without imparting any wood flavor at all. We always talk about wood in oak and there's, but there's plenty of different wood that's used. It's not just all oak, but sometimes you want to make wine with a little bit of an oxygen transfer because it, is, it ends up being a bit longer lived in the bottle. And then once you open the bottle, but without imparting any extraneous factors. So you're generally getting a better mouthfeel, but preserving the fruit of what you're vinifying without adding anything else to it. Right, just a neutral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it depends, the second answer, the second part of that question, it depends on the winery and the vessel. Sometimes they're completely sealed. Um, sometimes they're sealed just enough. Sometimes they're you know, sealed just so wine can't get out. It just depends on the preference of the winemaker. So that's a, a, a an answer that to that question is completely nuanced. 
per winery, I should say. And so for the curator specifically, is that one kind of same because it is a blend and it is something that is kind of tasted. And I know that in one of the paragraphs it said the wine that was finished first is what's chosen for that year's blend. And I thought that was so cute. Like which one, whichever one goes down the easiest. Um, you know, but I think specifically to the curator, um, is this one porous or sealed, or is it just vary from the individual winemakers? This um, this is slightly porous. It's not fully sealed. It's slightly porous. It's a pretty good size concrete tanks that he has. Um, one of the beauties about Adi Bodenhorst, the winemaker here, is that um, there's no formula. You know, you live by Mother Nature. And this kind of goes back, Charlotte, to your question that I interrupted, which is about organics and biodynamics. And that is, you know, Mother Nature, number one, is the thing that you go by, right? So if you're trying to make a formulaic wine, you're going to struggle vintage to vintage. If you're right. going to go with what Mother Nature is giving you and take it and run with it, then you're doing everything and everyone a better service, right? Um, so I do think that there's a move, you know, around the world and not just South Africa, whether they certify themselves organic or further biodynamic, that's up to them. I mean, that's also, you know, a bit of a jump through paper and money and things of that sort. But it's also just a, everyone's on this. Most people I hate to, to talk in absolutes. Most people are in the movement of you're farming in such a way that you are protecting the earth for your future generations. Right. You are just trying to make the best of what you can make and to give back in the best of ways because we have this one planet and it needs to be preserved for those yeah. coming next. We've heard, we've heard a lot of that um, over these last few weeks with the mm -hmm. virtual wine tastings and it's very, um, it's very nice to hear. Yeah. And everybody seems to be um, heading in that direction. So, okay. and, and again, not absolutes, not everybody, but um, many people, and, and a lot of these, and I hope that this has come across in the uh, series that we've been doing, is that these are families, these are farmers, um, and we're all in it, you know, we're all in this together. And um, and so it's nice to hear it from you. Can you hear, guys hear me all right? We can hear you. We can hear you. Well, I didn't introduce you. you like oh, hey. Have... I just was going to say, I was talking to a winemaker not that long ago, and they were talking about how they actually lived on the property that they farmed and uh, talking about your biodynamics and organics. And they said, like, I live here. I actually live here. And then I walk outside and those are the grapes. And I, I would rather have a, a you know, a, a holistic environment around my whole family. So that's not just about future generations, it's about the current, you know, the way that you currently live and the way that you run your vineyard and run your, your whole operation. It's, it's a way of life. And also it means you don't have to take drastic measures to counteract something else. That's another big thing is that, Oh, then you have to pump all of this effort into one mitigation technique to then, you know, sort of try to correct what you've done to mitigate another thing. And it's just a never ending cycle that does nothing for the actual soils itself. This way, the soils are more, you know, diverse, biodiverse, and they have mechanisms in place. And yeah, you're going to lose things sometimes, but that's the way that nature is. Sometimes your rosemary plant dies. You don't have any idea why. It just does. And you just move along. So why counteract it by just throwing a bunch of literally tons, literally we're talking tons of things onto your grapes. Um, deal with it as best you can and, and move on. And then you know, make the decisions in the in the uh, winery that you have to do as well. Like Lisa was saying, not just making something that's the same, dealing with it based on a year to year basis. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, oh, we're good. I think the um, the the definition remapped itself in my brain over the last few weeks, six weeks of of wine tastings from the mental imagery of farming to sustainability. There was a beautiful imagery of, you know, like a, a vineyard and, and it was like, a, you know, the, the crop, the people, you know, harvesting the grapes and like their family working the farm and like them at the house. It was a beautiful imagery that I saw and it really remapped it from just like not taking, you know, you're not depleting everything that you possibly can from the ground to make this one beautiful wine. You're really thinking about in 10 years, 
you know, what am I doing to this ground that potentially will still be producing beautiful wine in the best way for not only just my area, but the areas around me, the areas down the hill, um, you know, who's absorbing kind of some of the, the um, you know, reaction to whatever is being done to those different vineyards that are that are up uphill. So um, I, I love that. And I think that that sustainability is a huge component that a lot of our, our customers are really care about, you know, yeah, it's not just sure. about organic wines, um, you know, being that they want to be trendy, but yeah. it really is going back to that, you know, what are we doing to preserve our earth for, for tomorrow and for the generations to come? That's definitely been a theme, theme here. Um, and this is a wonderful example of that. Um, I think we're going to move on to the red. Yes. And I'm excited. So excited. Have you been to Lebanon? First of all, Lisa. I have not. We were, I was supposed to, we, a few of us in the company were supposed to go this year. And obviously given the chaos of yeah. our country, that wasn't happening. Um, in other countries, not just ours, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, that, would my, that would be my dream. I think like a lot of people. I think that would be a, a lot of people's dream for sure. Um, so the, the next one we're doing is from uh, Chateau Musar which is, I would say, the most famous um, winery in Lebanon. You can correct me. It's definitely the one that I know. Um, I don't think that I know any others, actually. So um, tell us about the red. Sure. So Chateau Muzar is um, just, you know, I, it's really hard for me to be succinct when I talk about this, and I'm going to try to be. And when I start to ramble, just ramble on. Absolutely. Just dig in there, do a little bit of this, whatever that is. Yeah, just great. <laughs> so Chateau Muzar is an enigma, um, not just because it's Lebanese, but just in the world of wine. And I think in the world of humans and everything that they've also had to deal with, right, in the political and, uh, yeah, political history of their company. So this is the Hoshar family. And the Hoshar family started in 1930. And uh, talking about organics from their inception in 1930, they have been certified organic farming in their vineyard. Um, but you won't see it printed on any of their labels at all on anything or any printed material that they have, because that's how, like most people view, that's how you should be farming. Right. You should be just sort of aware. Um, so Chateau Musar, yep, exactly. We're just um, in, the winery is just outside of Beirut. Um, Lebanon is a very narrow country. It's only about 50 miles wide and you can see two mountain ranges there. And the valley itself, the Baca is sort of sitting in the middle. Um, so the vineyards can be as far as, you know, a few hours away to go and to farm. And similar to Adi Bodenhorst, the curator, these vines are also bush vines. Nothing here is trellis. Um, this is mostly limestone soils where the Swartland was granite. This is limestone with clay. Um, okay. And mostly French varietals here as well. So Cinso, Cabernet Sauvignon, Grenache. Um, there's actually some Viognier grown here, Chardonnay, a little bit of... Uh, Bermentino, which in France you call it roll. Um, and then, you know, they also have indigenous Lebanese varietals called Obedi and Merois. So what we're tasting tonight is a range of, the, this is a range of wines, right? Every winery has like different tiers or ranges of what they produce. This yeah. is Jeune Rouge. So Jeune meaning young in France, in French, I should say in French language. Um, so young as in the youngest style of wine. So this wine doesn't see any oak either. It's all done in concrete tanks. And some of the youngest vineyards. So this is a blend of Cinso, Syrah, and Cabernet Sauvignon um, from bush vines that were planted about 30, 25 to 30 years ago. And totally fermented and then a little bit of aging in concrete tanks. And as I was reading about it, it said that it's unfiltered and... Um, can you explain that process of unfiltering uh, to everybody? What yeah. that means? Or not, yeah, not filtering. So both, um, you know, both of these wines, the Curator and the Jeune Rouge are naturally made wines. So they're not inoculated. They're not, there's not any um, 
yeast that is that inoculates to start the fermentation. It's a natural fermentation from ambient yeast that exists either in the vineyards, in the winery itself, in the fermentation vessels, right? Because yeast just lives around us. As we know that sometimes we make really good bread and sometimes we make not so great bread, uh, depending on what's going on. It's very true. And then, um, you know, nothing, there's no adjustments. So they're not adjusting, they're not adding any acid, which is completely legal in many, many countries around the world and especially warmer climates. Um, you're not adjusting for anything. You're adding sulfur and sulfites when you're bottling. That is a completely normal and natural preservative at a certain amount of right parts per million. Um, so in the case of this, if you want to fine or filter, you kind of um, take out some of those, what is simply called the solids that happen through the fermentation process. Solids that we can't really see with our eyes at this moment. Um, but if you were to let this wine age and age and age, you will start to see those solids sort of come together and drop in, in you know, sediment, basically. It's just, these are all very overgeneralized words for what's happening. Good for us. It's great. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I mean, I, it's also this, that would be like a whole other topic in conversation. <laughs> Definitely a whole other topic. I had three questions pop up that I was like, Jessica, that's not relevant right this second. Let's keep the conversation going. Um, but the education, I think, is one of the key components of just like understanding. I mean, keep, you're doing wonderfully. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank so I mean, back to Lebanon for, for me, like, I think that is the coolest thing. Um, I, and, and that's like 3,300 feet above sea level. Isn't that right? We're 3,300 feet above sea level. Yeah. So the, the actual vineyards that go in this particular bottling are not their highest elevation. They do have another bottling that is simply called Hoshar, which is their last name, Peri Ifis. So Hoshar, you know, father and son. Um, and that would be their highest elevation, which is about 3,600 feet, which is really, right? And this is a country where you can, you know, be in the ocean during the day and you can ski, you know, the next day. So it's quite high mountain range, but really lots of sun. Um, this is the Fertile Crescent. This is the original agriculture, part of the agriculture center of the world. So it's not unusual for grapes to be grown here by any means, and they have so for thousands and thousands of years. Exactly. So that's some of their, that's all bush vines. Um, that's obviously not quite that high elevation, but looking down one of their slopes. Um, and you can see just kind of how barren and, and how hot it does get, right, in the summertime, that soil. So that's limestone soil, clay. You can see the redness from the clay. Um, yeah. I'm, so one of the things about Chateau Musar, I mean, I've had some, uh, what I think is interesting is that, uh, and, and Fix can probably talk to this, let me ask my questions and then we'll mute, mute so you can talk. Um, they, they have so many old um, vintages that are still available and that's the coolest thing, I think. Um, tell us about that Fix, like what vintages they have and, and why you think that um, Chateau Musar is, maybe different than a lot of the domestic wines that we have here that bring things out and have some things that you can find that are older, but, but not, not as much. Well, that is a, a, as Lisa was saying, that's a, that's a question that can lead to a lot of different avenues for Muzar. Um, I think where it's grown has a big, big reason for that. The winemaking techniques that were learned um, in Bordeaux by um, the Hochars, um, originally learning about enology in Bordeaux um, is really crucial, especially when you're also growing things like Cabernet Sauvignon in Lebanon, because then understanding how those grapes can behave over long, long periods. Um, obviously, when you're in higher elevations, and Lisa can speak to this too, higher elevations and drier conditions, you're going to have uh, grapes behave differently than they normally would. Sanso specifically, I think, behaves much differently probably here than it does in, you know, south of France or, or in South Africa where, where it, you know, it was grown previously and then turned into Pinotage. Um, but there's, it's a lot to have to do with the style. It's, it has to do with the house style. Everybody knows a Muzar when they taste it, especially the Chateau bottle that you're talking about, the ones that are aged for a significant amount of time before they're even released there's a house style there. There's a style that they want to create so that people can enjoy these wines in their most mature form or see how they evolve over time. 
Um, and I think that that's a really key component to what the Hotar family does with their wines. It's not only about bringing wines out and, and seeing where they're at after being aged in the winery, but also giving people the understanding that they can lay these bottles down, not the Joan, but you know, the other Chateau bottles and lay them down and just see where they go and, and kind of pick and choose how they are against other vintages. I've had 99, 97, you know, 92, I think it was, um, not that long ago, we were selling some 1969, uh, last year uh, in Florida, and we sold some 1969 white and red, if I remember correctly. And so th it's just really interesting to see how the wines evolve over, you know, 50 years in some cases. And that's really exciting. And the unfining and unfiltering, I think, is a key component, again, to sort of how these wines behave as they age um, and how they change. And they're really, really exciting wines to try when you can pop open a 99 like we did last week. Uh, locally here and then decant it and which you have to do with the chateau bottle because of it's got it does have significant amount of sediment but also because of the winemaking it, it needs to breathe uh, as well uh, just like a fine bordeaux would i look at this wine like chateau muzard the same way i would look at latour uh or any of those kinds of wines i mean they yeah they are built to last and they're for your cellar and this is a good way to enjoy their wines while you're waiting for them to get to where you want them to be Right. You actually touched on something that I briefly wanted to recap. I made a mental note of myself to recap a bit more throughout the, the, the broadcast. But, you know, this this uh, Chateau Moussard the June is twenty three dollars a bottle. Um, you know, we are here at Air on Wine Market in Pensacola, Florida. You touched on something fixed momentarily about opening a 1969 bottle. And we had a call a few months ago for someone who wanted to celebrate her husband's birthday. He was born in 1969 and asked, do you have anything in the shop that was- And usually we laugh sale? at them because- In 1969, you just, you and I was like, um, when would you need it by? You know, was my, my initial thought because I knew if I had a few days perhaps, but you know, I think that's a really good thing to know that there are, are absolutely bottles available. Well, we, and, and not, not a lot. That, that's what, that's kind mm -hmm. of my point is that it's so nice that that these wines are available in older vintages when you know we just we we get them we drink them and and that's the you know uh the u.s way and that's okay and that's why they make wines for for easy consumption and this is a great example of something that you know you can get the great quality at a lower price because some of the older ones of course they're gonna they're gonna cost you because they've you know they've been sitting around and yeah. uh, and uh, not making any money <laughs> and so they um um but that's fascinating to know that you did open a bottle from 1969 we did have that request not too long ago so with special orders and a little pre-planning we can absolutely accommodate your needs yes we still have some i still have some 69 white actually uh available but um it's not it, it's and lisa can talk to this too and we talk about and we don't have to go on about the chateau bottling as much as this wine but it's just an interesting part to understand how this winery works um they're not just letting the bottles just sit there for 40 50 years i mean they taste the bottles um they recondition i mean they do some reconditioning on the corks and things like that too lisa isn't that right on some of those older yeah. bottles yeah so you guys have touched on so much that <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is what's so hard about, you know, this conversation is that I feel like it just go on for days. So the current, I'm, I'm just going to kind of go back and touch on like the, the spots there. So the current vintage of Chateau Rouge from the winery is 2013. And that's because that wine is not released until about seven and a half years after vintage. But it's, it is sitting in bottle for about three or four of that. So it's not sitting in oak that entire time. The Blanc of the Chateau Blanc of the indigenous varietals, the white varietals that I mentioned, Obedi and Marois, is 2012. So it sits in bottle for a little bit longer. So this is, the whites are almost more fascinating than the reds, right? Which is- I'm a white lover and I have tried the whites as well. Um, I'm, I, I, we need to have them in here all the time because they're that's fascinating. A, that's another show. That's not even like the same as Chateau Red. Next time, next that's time. Um, but yeah, it's all about the farming. It's all about the winemaking. There's a lot of racking. There's a lot of concrete. There's a lot of oxygen, um, completely natural. They, they, the Hosher family believes that their wines really start to peak around 20 years. So awesome. 
it's, you know, right now we're in 2020 and we, the 98, 99, 2000, 2001s are just like on just amazing. And they last for days, you know, once you open them as well. They do need to be canted, Michael's correct, not just for sediment, but also for you need to just let them kind of come out. They're alive, they're, they're live things. And they get better after a couple of days, for sure. They peak usually after like day three. So that leads wow. me to a question about the Zhuin. Um, how, would you would you lay that down for a while? Or would you, um, I mean, it's it's drinking now, wonderfully now, mm -hmm. but how, what, what is its age ability? Sure, I mean, I just had a, a Zhuin 2013 the other day. So yeah, for sure. We just don't, they don't hold on to these and neither do we in our, you know, our warehouse. So we warehouse obviously in the United States and that's where we keep. So we get containers from the winery twice a year in our warehouse here in the United States. We have the Chateau Rouge back to 1956, not contiguous, but back to 56. And we have the white back to 66. That was 1956. If you didn't hear that the first time, I'm sorry, I'm astounded. That's amazing. And you know, not too long ago, about a year ago, we had a big tasting in our office and I had 1972 Rouge. And I, we had a number of vintages, but the 72 Rouge and the 72 Blanc were the vintages that were just like, and that's amazing. Wow. I mean, you, yeah, I mean, 72, and if it's a red, then yeah, I mean, you can see that, but a white wine, I think that is just incredible. Amazing after three days. So yeah, the Jeune definitely can age as well. It's just, we don't, they don't, meaning the winery and us, we just don't keep it along, around long enough to do that. But yeah. yeah. And that's a wine you're gonna have on your weeknight, you know, eating. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we could talk a little bit about food pairings. We didn't mention a lot about food pairings with the curator that, um, but with Muzar, certainly um, we have actually a few great, really good uh, Middle Eastern places here in Pensacola. And, you know, you talk about doing something like this with Tabuli or uh, if somebody can find somebody who makes kibbe, which is a, a great, you know, sort of Lebanese dish, um, lamb, obviously, you know, stuff like that. But, um, you know, the, I, I wanted to also touch on the fact that I, people are sometimes surprised that they hear Lebanese wine. When you talk about the Near East or even the Mid East and, you know, the sort of Eastern European caucus regions, these are like some of the oldest cultures in, you know, like sort of uh, the world. And also some of the oldest, if not the oldest in the case of like Georgia and, and, and Armenia, the oldest wine you know, cultures in the world where some people believe and have had evidences that such as that these grape vines, um, wine grapes originated here wild in wild fashion in, in this part of the world in the Near East. And so I think when people are hearing, oh, Lebanese wine, that's a little bit different. That must be a new thing. No, not at all. There is a thing called, I mean, I'm not going to be like religious, but there's a thing called the Bible that talks about wine. That was quite a long time ago and that's not that far from here. So you shouldn't be surprised to see something like this uh, or wines like this. And yeah, they're doing some different grapes, but um, you know, th this this place was built to make wine, I mean, really. Yeah, it's interesting that there, I mean, uh, I know there's a lots of reasons why there's not, but th you just don't hear of it. And I think that's why people are, I mean, if you think about it logically, like you said, yeah, mm -hmm. it makes sense, but we don't, we don't get it in the United States. So right. it's kind of a yeah. novelty for us. Um, but it's something that <laughs> we definitely need to get on board with because um, these wines are incredible. And to find something that's um, the price, the 23 is what we're selling this one for, Absolutely. Um, that you could put in your cellar and enjoy in a year or two years and, or longer, I don't know. Um, and I had uh, I pulled a bottle that was, um, I don't want to say what it was, but anyway, it was uh, a 2003 um, cab and it was like you don't you don't see those you have to wait for those you know and it's hard to do that um, but with some of these vintages we can we can get those for you now you don't have to wait you know somebody else has done the waiting for you so um, it's that's kind of nice point. that's a good point yeah probably. they're aged for you they're ready to go yeah I love exactly that. Lisa yeah. Yeah. We're going to bring you where we are. We're at 41 minutes. Uh, you've given us so much of your time today Thank you so and your much. knowledge. 
I mean, I'm sure that we could pick your brain. We probably need to just go ahead and schedule the next one. So yeah, I was going to say, we're going to have to have you back. It's the oh, of this broadcast. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you for letting me talk about our wines. Oh, um, yeah. I just appreciate it. So I'd love to uh, stay safe and we'll see Absolutely. you. In, hopefully, we'll see you in Pensacola next time you're here. Sounds Thank good. You. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, Mike. Well, that's cool. She's got a so lot, cool. um, got a lot of great information. And I know we did her Vino Verde. Um, and I can't remember the red we did, um, that, but it was also delicious. I don't know if Fix remembers the red that we did. Um, broad a broadbent red? Yeah, with the Vino, Vino Verde. And anyway, it doesn't really matter. They're all, all delicious wines. and they, they We just tasted some of their Madeira, right, the other day, too. So they have some great dessert wines, if anybody wants some broadbent dessert wines. That Madeira. That's a really yeah. good point. The they cool do. things of being a team member at Aragon Wine Market is you have a fix come and do a, an amazing class on ports. And, and, and we, did uh, Madeira, yeah. we did the Madeira. Yeah. It was very educational and really cool to, yeah, to just, navigate that. Didn't suck. It didn't <laughs> suck. Not at all. We don't pay well, but we got a lot of little benefits like that, right? <laughs> well, speaking of benefits, how about somebody's birthday show is next week? And I think we're going to be doing a couple of bottles of bubbly for Senorita Bubblita. <laughs> Senorita Bubblita. That's I will I'll take that name. So we next week we are doing um my favorite bubbly that's um not a champagne. <laughs> um, it's Francois Montan. Actually, my dog is named Francois after Francois. Is he gonna Montan. do a cameo? He might. We will see. We'll cameo see how he, well he behaves. Yeah. He is um, only nine months old, so he's still a little hyperactive and um, got stuff going on. So he's very busy. <laughs> it's like a toddler. <laughs> he's, he's a teenager now, so he's going kind of, even right? worse. Yeah. But so what we are going to feature is let's start with the brute. Okay. Um, the brute, which everybody knows and loves, um, it's the Francois Montan brute, delicious. Um, the rose bottle, fourteen. Yeah, the rose is also one that um, everybody's seen, everybody's loved. Um, I mean, I like I drink the rose a good bit before I drink the brute. I love them both now. Mm -hmm. That one's well, pricing you, 15. Ah, 15. And so one that you might not have seen is um, the Ice Edition. And uh, I would say a few years ago, they came out with this. And and Fix can probably tell us a little more. But um, what um, a lot of um, even, uh, gosh, some of the big champagne names um, came up with. Um, thank you. Came up with. Um, bubbles that are meant to be drunk over ice. Um, so this is their ice edition. So you need a big old glass, um, you need some ice in it, and then you pour that and it's meant to be drunk over ice. So my suggestion to you, and Fix can tell us a little more, but my suggestion to you is maybe grab some um, sushi, maybe grab some, uh, if you don't want to fix uh, dinner, grab some popcorn or chips and join us for the Francois Montan. Definitely. Absolutely. What do you think, Vic? Yeah. Bubbles are great with almost any kind of food. So, I mean, you know, they, they go, it's not only just because they have fruit and their wine, which is great with food anyway, but also they have bubbles, which help to kind of cleanse, cleanse your palate a little bit. If, if you have some certain foods and also they're usually higher in acid as well. Most sparkling wines or a lot of sparkling wines, at least the good ones. And so they're really well balanced to go with things that are salty or fatty. Yeah. Uh, the rosé, the rosé would be great with with seafood as well. Would be great with sushi. Oh, I mean, my oh, fried chicken and potato chips are the best bubbly combination. I think there is right? my favorite. Totally. Yeah, my favorite combination. I must be enlightened. I don't know anything about. And, and typically when we talk about, um, and we'll talk about this more maybe next week, but when we talk about a brute wine, they have more residual sugar than uh, a, a glass of Sauvignon Blanc or something like that. Um, so, but you don't really notice it because you have high acid and bubbles, which help to keep it in balance. And so because you have a little bit more sugar, you can pair it with some spicier food as well. Um, so you can, you can, because it, it, your, your palate is just all in balance. That's why bubbles are best pairing wine that there is because they have everything you want. They have a little sugar, 
bubbles, acid, fruit. It's everything you want. Yeah, totally. And Doug is asking if they're very dry. I would say the brood is the brood is the driest. The rosé is less dry, and the ice is um, least dry of them because it's meant to be um, drunk over ice, and so it's going to um, dilute as it as ice melts. Sure, but it's it's a demi sec style too. So for a lot of another reason why the ice products and you know we'll talk more about it next week why they were being brought out as such was to you know introduce people who might be wanting somewhat sweeter wines to sort of give you know champagne a chance um, or or sparkling wine styles a chance. Um, so a demi sec is 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 a little bit sweeter than a brute but some people don't know what that means demi sec so this was also a way for to for companies and winemakers to introduce people to something as well like you said yeah diluting it is great it actually you know it, it is a great way to drink it but also it's a, an opportunity to get people behind a champagne style wine where they might not think that it's to their liking so it's a really good party wine the demi sec is and it's really good for make drinking on ice but it's great for cocktails and it's great for making punch if you ever make punch it's really good in punch. Well, maybe um, maybe go to um, uh, Aragon Wine Market's Facebook page in the meantime, um, and we'll have some little hints on cocktails or food pairings or those kind of things in preparation of next week's wine. I anticipate the next week to be all about bubbles, all the bubbles. So. All about dogs and bubbles. Yes, puppies <laughs> and champagne. Puppies and bubbles. Well, Carol, we're excited that you're going to come in this week and definitely yeah. want you to celebrate with us or celebrate with Charlotte. I'm going to be celebrating inherently. Just by yes, virtue we all celebrate here. anytime. Thanks, Fix. Well, we have, you're welcome. And we have yeah. Paul Dietz yeah. Paul Paul coming in next week, too. So Say that again? Paul Dietz is going to come on with us next week. And, um, awesome. Awesome. He's, a, he's a great Aussie guy that is not, um, you know, not hard to look at. So for any of the ladies oh, that are out there. Perfect. Wow. Are, we yes. like Paul. We like Paul. He's a handsome devil. Come on, ready to mingle. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks. thank we'll you, Fix. See, uh, see you later. Right, he's married. Okay. I was talking okay. about me. <laughs> all right. Have a great. Thank you so much, as always. All right. Ciao. So cool. Cool. And once again, that was a fun, fun um, visit and so informative. Yeah. Lisa is really cool. And I'm glad we got the sound figured out. Thanks, Definitely. Doug. Yes. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, everybody, for your suggestions. We're going to yeah. start muting and changing. Yeah, volumes. we're working on it. I we're mean, working we're, not, we're no sound men mm -mm. or girls. Nope. But um, I did not go into TV broadcasting, <laughs> but I like to pretend. So. Well, you're doing well. Thank you. So the, uh, I know. We are, we are still live. Yes, we are. Thanks. Thanks for letting us know. Hey, y'all are still live. We know we're live. Thanks. Um, we're super excited to have you guys join us next week. Like yeah. Charlotte mentioned, it's birthday week, so we're all about the bubbles. Francois, all about the bubbles. Francois. My Montag. little dog may make a, um, we'll make a, um, a cameo. We'll see. Um, also, don't forget, if you're interested in any of the wine boxes that we talked about earlier, um, we're still taking orders. Yeah, um, we're still on case one. We're still on case one. So it's the first 12 wines that we drank um, uh, during these virtual tech wine tastings um, at a 15% discount. So yeah, case one was literally $42 plus of savings. So yeah. it's well worth it. You um, they're money incredible and wines. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're really, I mean, my favorite thing about it is they're just different. They're not the case. That case of wine is not anything that you would pick up and be like, gosh, oh. and case two is going to be awesome too. I mean, yes. like the ones we did tonight, I, mean, I don't know if we talked about the curator was 10 bucks. Um, I know that we, we talked skipped about that the pricing. Was yeah. so, we did. so, I mean, they're, we always try and find interesting and unique. And that is the tagline for Aragon wine market. Um, Unique and affordable. Unique and affordable. And open to the public. I actually, I told you this. I had someone come in this week. We had a week, blogger come in today. A, uh, a wonderful girl that came in and said, oh, I didn't even realize I've seen this for years and years. I had no idea you were open to the public. I just thought you serviced the neighborhood. I was like, oh, honey, we are open. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, we're absolutely open to the public. If there's anybody out there that doesn't think you can come in. Yeah. No. Or the things that we have, I, I've also gotten this question recently. Do you have anything in the store under $50? Yeah. 
most of what's in the store is absolutely mm -hmm. available and ready for you to drink at a moderate price point where you can enjoy and explore. Yeah. Um, we absolutely have those high end wines here, certainly. Um, you know, but just a prime example of tonight is ten dollars and twenty three. They're absolutely delicious. Yeah, and we can order for you, like yeah. the um, the Chateau Mazar, the the nicer ones. I don't want to say nicer because they're they're both really nice. The aged, but the aged ones. Um, if you're interested, if you're like, gosh, that sounds cool. Mm -hmm. I've never tried a 1972 white absolutely um yeah well, you know come in let us price it out for you i don't that's right it sounds expensive that sounds expensive <laughs> but if it's it for a special though. order perhaps just give us a couple of weeks so we can get it in before that actual birthday you can't call us on the birthday yeah you got to give us a couple of days and then we'll be happy to get that in for you but it still might cost something if it's a 72 <laughs> right well thanks so much for tuning in and um i think that's a wrap ciao